my name is Edward Greber. I'm a staff scientist at Vitalent Research Institute in San Francisco, California. I've been working for approximately the last five years on methods for estimating uh, population level HIV incidence, in particular using biomarkers of recent infection. And a large part of my work is focused on characterizing um, tests for recent infection including both um, so-called HIV incidence assays and recent infection testing algorithms. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at this workshop. And I'll be speaking about methods for estimating HIV incidence from cross-sectional data using uh, recent infection assays and algorithms. So by way of background, uh, biomarkers of recent HIV infection are widely used to estimate population level HIV incidence um, from co cross-sectional population survey data. For example, the population HIV impact assessment surveys that are supported by the US government and numerous national level surveys conducted throughout the world. Application of the, the methods used in these surveys to HIV prevention efficacy trials, that is cross-sectionally estimated baseline incidence in the trial population, um, uh, providing the counterfactual rather than a placebo arm in the trial shows great promise, which may have substantial ethical and logistical advantages in a in the context of um, highly effective prevention interventions um, like existing PrEP drugs being available. Now, in order to estimate incidence using a test for recent infection, it's critical that we understand the behavior of the test. And most of my presentation today will focus on uh, things to keep in mind in characterizing uh, tests for recent infection. Um, it's worth noting that um, in order to characterize these tests, uh, we need to conduct fairly complex and expensive calibration studies that rely on unique specimen sets uh, derived from seroconverters with precisely estimated times of infection, since we need to characterize the biomarker evolution over time. Um, and really, there are only a couple of groups globally who have specimen panels of these kinds, uh, including the CEFIA collaboration, a group at Hopkins University, um, and um, uh, colleagues at the US CDC. Um, a brief note um, about estimating incidents in chronic non-remissible conditions like HIV. Uh, the key problem with estimating incidence generally is that we are observing events, that is changes in population states as opposed to a population status quo. Now with um, transient short-term conditions like influenza or SARS-CoV-2 infection, Incidence is in fact very closely related to the prevalence of the condition. Um, the distinction is in fact almost a, a fine point. If we know the average duration of the infection and the proportion of the population that is infected at any given time, we can easily get the incidence. But with long lasting chronic conditions like HIV, a troublesome disconnect between prevalence and incidence is introduced. Now, if we have a biomarker um, of recent infection, we are reintroducing a transient state, that state of recent infection, uh, which um, uh, allows us to recover the easy link between the prevalence of that transient state at a given time, um, the duration of that state, um, and the incidence. That, that's the fundamental concept behind cross-sectional incidence estimation. But there are numerous subtleties, some of which we um, will discuss today very briefly. Um, 
Now, if we imagine a biomarker that involves over time uh, when someone becomes infected, um, the evolution of that biomarker might look something like what you're seeing on the screen today, um, although this is just schematic. Each of the colored curves here represents an individual person's biomarker evolution over time. And there's a, a high degree of variation, variability in these individual trajectories. Now, we can turn a biomarker of this kind into a, a test for recent infection by applying thresholds as shown by the dashed lines uh, on this plot. Um, and by saying that when we observe a value below that threshold, we classify that person as recently infected. But as you can see, if we look at um, any given threshold, for example, the, the top line, um, you'll see there's a, um, a fairly high degree of diversity in the times at which individuals cross that threshold and if we pick higher thresholds, in fact, some individuals never cross that threshold. And so our methods for estimating incidents must um, account for this high degree of um, intersubject variability. Now, how do we characterize a test of, for recent infection of this kind? There are two critical test characteristics that we must define. The first is the mean duration of recent infection or the average time that an individual will spend exhibiting the recent biomarker after becoming infected and the false recent rate that is the proportion of long infected individuals who nevertheless produce a recent result on the test. Uh, note that the MDRI captures essentially the biological characteristics of the test, um, although it is somewhat sensitive to epidemiological context while the FRR is inevitably context dependent. Now to calibrate these biomarkers, we might want to fit a family of curves similar to what you've seen there um, uh, and um, derive from this, the mean duration of recent infection, false recent rate, but this leads to complex methodological problems. So instead of doing that, we typically summarize the dynamics of the test into a model that captures uh, no details on the individual biomarker dynamics, but compresses the information into a single function for the probability of obtaining a recent result as a function of time since infection. Um, and that curve gives us for each value of time since infection, the probability that any given individual in the population will return a recent result. And those curves look like this, um, with each curve here encoding a different recency discrimination threshold. And we are then able to fairly easily obtain the average duration of the recent state by obtaining the area under the, under the curve for the pro probability of recent infection as a function of time since infection at a given threshold. Uh, so this is much easier to obtain um, than accurately characterizing those individual trajectories you first saw. Now note that as we raise the threshold, the standard cross-sectional incidence estimate described by Kassenji in 2012 becomes initially more robust because the states we are describing then become less transient. But if we raise the th threshold too high, um, the curves eventually, these PR of T curves eventually fail to reach zero for times long after infection, introducing high false recent rates, uh, which um, um, has a, um, a very big impact on the statistical precision of incidence estimates, uh, incidence estimates. Um, uh, you see there the cross-sectional incidence estimate and maybe just worth pointing out that essentially the numerator is corrected by the false recent rate and the 
denominator has the uh, mean duration of recent infection in it as a as a major term denoted by omega and the false recent rate here denoted by uh, beta. Now, something else worth noting is that typically we make use of recent infection testing algorithms rather than single assays. The reason for this is that single biomarkers, which are usually immune markers, tend to have too poor performance to support incidence estimates of sufficient precision. Uh, the reason for this is primarily uh, a, a high proportion, a, a high false recent rate, um, which is largely the result of um, viral suppression in the population, uh, either because of uh, the use of antiretroviral treatment or natural elite control, uh, which leads to a kind of zero reversion where people may not become HIV negative on antibody based diagnostic assays, but um, start appearing recently infected on these immune markers again, after some time on treatment. And as um, treatment coverage is expanded in most countries, this has increasingly become a problem for incidence estimation. Of course, it's a good thing, but it makes the lives of um, uh, su uh, surveillance uh, people a bit more difficult. So we construct algorithms to classify uh, individuals as recently infected or, or not um, based on a definition of HIV positivity. Some immune marker typically a value below some threshold um, viral load above some threshold, in other words, not virally suppressed, and sometimes additionally also um, the absence of antiretroviral drugs uh, measured through uh, mass spectrometry or similar. Uh, and the full algorithm classification is then what is used. Now I've, I've noted that the uh, performance of recency tests and recency algorithms are depend on epidemiological context. I'll just very briefly mention some of the issues. They're far too complex to discuss in detail today. Um, but the epidemiological context determines incidence and prevalence in the population. The treatment coverage, um, which as we've seen, um, has important implications for performance. HIV subtype mix, um, the immune markers we rely on often evolve somewhat differently uh, with um, a different HIV genotypes. A distribution of times since infection in the population, uh, which is a function of epidemic history, and then characteristics of the, um, of the survey or study being done like sample size and the case definition of um, HIV positivity and all of these things interact um, to determine the performance of our test for recent infection and therefore the precision of incidence estimates and our power to detect incidence differences and incidence change. Um, so just to briefly note that um, Estimating a context-specific MDRI involves numerous details, but one key detail may be that we have to obtain a weighted average of subtype-specific curves for the probability of obtaining a recent result as a function of time since infection to account for the specific subtype mix in the population where the study is being done, which is likely to be different from that in the seroconversion panels we use to calibrate the test in the first place. Um, to estimate context-specific FRR, uh, we have to know something about the distribution of times since infection in the untreated population, uh, encoding epidemic history, um, and fit a similar curve uh, um, um, 
to cover the range of entry the time since infection. We then also have to be concerned about the FRR in the treated population. So we may have um, a um, factor for the treatment coverage denoted C in the, in the equation you're seeing here um, and separate probabilities of obtaining a recent result in the treated and untreated populations. And you also see there a term row of T, which is a weighting function encoding the uh, distribution of times since infection in the population. Um, so that was quite a lot of information, very um, uh, presented in a very abbreviated form. Um, but just to summarize the key point, key points, um, cross-sectional incidence estimation raises numerous complex methodological issues and numerous subtle issues that have to be addressed both at the time of study design and at the time of analyzing the data. Um, the choice of the algorithm that we use to classify individuals as recently infected or uh, long-term infected has a huge impact on the precision of incidence estimates. And so the, 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 the selection of recency classification algorithm, the characterization of that algorithm and optimizing our algorithm on the basis of uh, maximizing uh, the precision of incidence estimates or minimizing the uncertainty in incidence estimates is a very important part of steady design. Um, and lastly, accurate characterization of the recency test or algorithm is critical to avoid bias in our incidence estimates. So the two things we're aiming for is maximal precision and minimal bias. Uh, and characterizing the, the test for recent infection requires expensive and challenging calibration studies using rare specimen panels. Uh, but critically, uh, we cannot simply rely on published estimates of performance characteristics because these performance characteristics are not properties of the assay or even of the algorithm. Um, they are properties of the algorithm and the particular epidemiological context in which the algorithm is being applied. And therefore, contextual adaptation of our test performance characteristics is a critical part of study design and uh, data analysis. Mm -hmm.